This week, we're in British Columbia's capital city, Victoria, on the southern tip of Vancouver Island, investigating one of the hottest trends in restaurants today, farm to table. Spinnaker's Brew Pub overlooking Victoria's beautiful inner harbor has been one of the pioneers in the farm to table movement. So who better to ask than my co-host and Spinnaker's executive chef, Ali Ryan, what does farm to table really mean? It's the idea that uh, what is growing around us on the island, Fraser Valley, wherever you live, mm -hmm. um, that there is inherent value in that product over product that is shipped in from Mexico or California. Chef to chef, yep. what would you rather have? A one day old strawberry or a two week old strawberry? Yep. You can talk about it on an economic front as well. Uh, so the more money that local restaurants put into our local farming community, the stronger those communities become, yep. the more robust they become, the more able farmers are to to grow more, to experiment more, to you know, just become more varied and diverse, right. and so they can offer us more um, throughout the year. But the other thing, the most important thing, or one of the most important things, um, I think, to just island life, it's farm to table is more fun. It is more dynamic. It is yeah. like you can go, you can pick your vegetables, you can talk to the farmer. Yeah, so get your butt up off the sofa, get out, of the fr out from in front of the television and go out and meet a farmer. Totally, have some fun. That's what we're gonna do. All right, All right. sounds good. The first stop on our farm to table exploration takes me just a few kilometers north of Victoria. We're on the beautiful Saanich Peninsula, visiting every chef's dream. 10 Acres Farm is dedicated to growing food for its own group of restaurants. Today we're going to go and meet their farm manager, Adam. Let's go see. 10 Acres Farm is owned by restaurateur Mike Murphy and supplies fresh organic produce to his three restaurants. I'm meeting up with farm manager Adam, who is showing me around this fascinating operation. The farm also raises livestock, including cows, goats, turkeys, hens, and pigs. I asked Adam why they've decided to raise their own animals for the restaurants. What goes into the animals obviously has a huge effect on the, the quality of the meat. Um, these guys, you know, they're active, yeah. <laughs> as we can see. <laughs> they're out, uh, they have range of this whole area, rooting things up. Um, and so obviously that activity um, affects their muscle growth and the quality of the meat. And then also what they're eating, you know, they get grain, but they also are out there rooting up blackberry roots and grass roots and bugs and eating up all that stuff. And all and of that will impact the eventual flavor of the meat. Also. Yeah, it affects the flavor and also I think the nutrition. They've, they've found that uh, the fats tend to be better right. um, better for you when with chicken eggs and uh, chicken meat and pig meat when they have access to free range and uh, natural foods. I mean, it makes sense if you think about it, doesn't it? You know, if they're, if they're consuming all natural products, mm -hmm. then the meat is going to taste as it's supposed yeah. to, as opposed to being full of who knows what. Exactly, exactly. This is, these are pigs being pigs, being, you know, coming out tasting like what pigs should taste like. Um, sometimes we kind of get away from that. These pigs are fully grown, but Adam is taking me to visit some new arrivals. Well, Adam, I've heard the story about the ugly duckling, but these ducklings are actually pretty cute in here. Oh yeah, they're, they're pretty close to peak cute right now. They're about a week old. Okay. Uh, so one week ago they hatched from an egg like this. Okay. And you hatch them and here on the farm? Yep, yeah, in these incubators here. Okay. At seven weeks, they'll be five to six pounds. Just um, seven weeks? Yeah. So that's ready for the that's ready for the kitchen. Yep. Wow, that's that's much quicker than I than I thought. Ducks that's, grow really fast. Wow, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I didn't know that. So one thing I've not noticed on the property is, is a pond. So do they, mm. they don't need water? It's not essential um, for them to have a, they, a water no, source? They don't need, we usually give them like a kiddie pool okay. or uh, bin kind of thing with a ramp to go yep. up into because they, they love the water right yep. um, yeah but they don't absolutely need it uh, we will be digging a pond this summer actually okay. down in the pasture below where the pigs were oh right okay uh, so so when it comes to to keeping your ducks happy mm -hmm. um, obviously the kiddie pool is is part of that <laughs> process but what other things can you do to create you know ducks that are that are grown in a, in a very calm happy um, productive yeah. lifestyle 
Um, pasture is, is essential. Like these guys in the morning, I could have, when I let them out in the morning into their run, mm -hmm. they could have a big bucket of food right there right. and they would still just go into the grass and go billing around in the grass looking for slugs. Do what they're naturally kind of designed stuff. to do. Exactly. Yeah. Let, the, let the ducks be ducks, right? That's right. And if that natural behavior is eating slugs, then it's a win-win for everybody, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. All of the produce and livestock from 10 Acres Farm provides their three Victoria restaurants with this wonderful, fresh local food. I follow the trail to downtown Victoria to visit one of them, the stylish 10 Acres Kitchen right on the Inner Harbour. Here we are in the 10 Acres Kitchen with Chef Marcelo Najadro, who is going to prepare some of the duck, obviously not the baby duck we saw earlier, but with some of the duck from the 10 Acres Farm and uh, do a beautiful dish with it for us today. Yeah. Marcelo starts by scoring the skin of the duck breast. Usually just a little bit of salt and then as it is. And this is of course into a pan with no oil because no. of course there's lots of fat in it the skin. It would be a lot of fat coming up from the skin. It's a very low heat, cold pan, and then just let it be. Don't touch it, don't, don't look at it. 10 minutes after, 15 minutes after, you're gonna start seeing that the color change. It start getting golden and all that. So that's exactly what we wanna do, but we wanna just have it going. And of course, all that fat in the pan has come out of the skin of the duck. Yeah, exactly. We came with the pan cold, with no fat, no oil, no butter, no nothing. It's just the pure fat of the duck. And then after that, we're gonna just flip it over, throw it in the oven for no more than 10 minutes, and then serve it off medium rare. And, that's, that's to me, and of course, that is the, the best the way to serve thing. duck, yeah. isn't it? It's medium rare. So we've got a little potato pave here. And of course, this is just sliced potato, cooked cream, infused with a little garlic, a little yeah. rosemary thyme. And, and of course, you're going to use the duck fat, the duck which fat. is one of one of gastronomy's most wonderful ingredients, isn't it? It is beautiful. And then we have asparagus from the farm. We have uh, also carrots, a little bit of clear chicken stock. This is just for the vegetables. A little bit of butter. Yeah. I don't need it to cook too long. Oh, that looks beautiful. So it's nice. It's just nice and. Firm, a little bit of still yep. salt a little spongy. and veggie. Just to square it up a little just for presentation. But. Okay. A few of our blackberries. Oh, that looks beautiful. And again, these are from the farm? This is from the farm as well. Well, Marcelo, I am very excited to try this. This looks, it almost looks too good to eat, but <laughs> I'm going to eat it anyways. The duck is perfect. The duck is perfectly cooked. Got a little sauce on there. Oh, that's a beautiful duck. Nicely seasoned. Good. Skin's crispy, not too fatty. The duck itself is cooked absolutely spectacular. 10 acres are bringing food grown on their own farm into the city. But Chef Ali Ryan is visiting a Victoria project that's taking local food to a whole new level. This disused industrial site in Victoria's Docklands doesn't look much like a farm, but for entrepreneur Chris Heldreth, any disused land is an opportunity. Chris has converted this small piece of wasteland into an amazingly productive urban oasis and is already supplying three nearby restaurants, including Ali's Kitchen at Spinnaker's. I'd love to see where Spinnaker's food is growing. Can yeah, you show me? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I've split the plot up into three sections, obviously, because we have three restaurants. Your section is right in front of us here. Uh, Canoe is to the left, and then Fiamo is right behind us. With the restaurant so close by, chefs like Gabe Milne of the Canoe Restaurant can just drop by to keep up with what's growing. So this is the arugula that I wanted to try and get to you uh, today. So all this is coming up. So it's nice and spicy. This it's was co-op. <laughs> yeah, this was done from a transplant. This is the wildfire, it's coming up, so we seeded that. It's pretty dense, but we'll uh, thin that out for you. It's not just chefs that are on board with Chris's urban farm. For us at Dockside, we, we quite often talk about sustainability. And once you're in that discussion, you really start to focus on what's happening in the city. And Chris, again, was one of those folks uh, that was trying something new. A year ago, he was on a rooftop in the downtown core, growing a, a small urban garden with 400 square feet as a pilot project. So what motivated Chris to begin this project? Why did we get to this point where all of our food is coming from so far away? It's potentially being sprayed with a lot of you know, harmful chemicals being wrapped up in so much plastic packaging and we're not able to see any of it and it doesn't taste that good. Like, how, how did we get to this point? Yes. Innovative urban agriculture like this 
is part of the solution. Rural farmers, local farmers are part of the solution. People growing at home are part of the solutions. So who can grow this? Like who, who can do this? Uh, anyone can do it. Anyone can grow food. I mean, essentially it can go onto any rooftop, it can go onto any vacant land, it can go onto any patio, it can go onto any balcony. We can move this model anywhere that we want. So really, we all can be urban farmers. 100%, yeah, for sure. Another big advantage of growing in the center of the city is delivery. Chris can get his produce to the restaurants in minutes, no matter how much traffic there is, and with no pollution. It's not just the restaurants that are using more local produce. Independent grocery stores like the Root Cellar are increasingly filling their shelves from local farmers. Right now we have 44 locally grown produce items, which is we're quite proud of for April. Um, and by peak produce season, that will at least double. It's a priority for most of our customers. Everyone's sort of incentive for making it a priority is different. For some people, it's supporting the local economy, the whole we live on an island yep. mentality. Some people, it's nutrient density. Right. You know, this strawberry was picked probably yesterday. Yep. Um, every minute that it's after it's been picked, we've cut its umbilical cord, right? It's losing the nutrient nutrients. density. So the Dimension. faster it enters your body, the more vitamins you're getting. Yep. And people are learning about the dire consequences to our planet yep. of, you know, these huge scale farming. Um, it's just a choice we all are going to have to make. Absolutely. And Victoria's ahead of the curve. One of the challenges with sourcing food locally is that many foods are not available all year round. So preserving foods becomes really important. There are many traditional techniques to extend the shelf life of food, and I'm visiting a true master at one of them. I am so excited to be here because this is by far my favorite food store in all of Victoria with my very good friend, Corey Pellin, owner and founder of the Whole Beast Fine Cured Meats. Corey, thanks for having us. Thank you. It's, it just smells so fantastic in here. This really is it. So it's like a, I'm, I'm a proverbial kid in the candy store. Yeah, me too, every day. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the whole beast. What is it and what's your, what's your mantra? We decided to offer cured meats of all kinds from all over the world, but doing it our way right. from more of a chef-driven standpoint. Right. For years, uh, processing meat, um, a big factor in the business part was the art of getting water into your meat. Yeah. There's a bunch of really sort of almost poisonous ways of doing that. Right. And it's really common to see that, um, see phosphates as an ingredient. Right. They're really effective. And we used to call it in the business pumping yeah. meat. You'd see chicken breasts pumped yeah. with water and they're super cheap. They're full of water. They're selling you water That's at right. That's right. $25 it's very expensive a water, kilo. <laughs> So yes, we're charging more, but it just makes a better product at the end of the day. It tastes better. And that's, well, that's our, can, that's our I goal. I can vouch for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The process takes place in Corey's own temperature and humidity controlled aging room. Want to take a look? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Wow. The go. smell. The smell just hits you, doesn't it, when it come, comes out there? Yeah. That's incredible. Now, will they interact with one another? I presume it's a, it's yeah. a you know, symbiotic environment, so they're all gonna impact one another somehow, but sure. you know, do you find that there's... Well, there's stuff like the mold, yeah. um, that although we, we do, we introduce the mold okay. in distilled water and spray it, yeah. um, it will eventually populate on its own. We just right. give it a little help, yeah. and we make sure that bad molds don't exist in here by keeping this one really healthy and really vibrant. Yep. Um, that's kind of, that's mostly what you smell is, right. the, is the mold and, and some of the byproducts from its okay. life cycle. Yep. Um, there are other things like, uh, like yeasts and enzymes that populate naturally. Yep. And we call it um, microbial terroir. And that's gonna be different to this region right. than say, if you were doing the same thing in San Francisco exactly. or in Spain. Yeah that terroir, whatever is gonna be populating, um, are, are gonna be native to that region. Some of those meats will age for months, but I can't wait that long. I wanna try some of that sausage right now. Super earthy, so, rustic. Porcini, black pepper. A little bit of nutmeg, yeah, and white pepper. That's some good sausage. So it's not like a full uh, mushroom blast. No, it, it changes, just, it can becomes a very big umami. Kind of yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah. that, that earthiness and that umami just sort of comes around after it's been in the mouth for a few minutes or a few seconds. And, oh, it's delicious. Thanks. That man. really is fantastic. Mm -hmm.
that was just wonderful. I love Corey's store. I, I just go in there all the time and spend far too much money. What we're going to do today is an old classic Alsatian dish, but we're going to give it a West Coast kick. We're going to do choucroute garni. We're going to use some beautiful fresh chard and collard greens out of my garden fresh this morning. Plus we've got some beautiful meats from Corey's The Whole Beast. We've got some beautiful salt pork. We've got this beautiful monstrous smoked pork hock. We've got a very special chorizo, one of Corey's specialities. And of course, a little bit of garlic coil, which will add that garlicky richness to our dish. First thing I've got going on, over in my pot here, I've taken some of my salt pork fat and I have cut it up very small and rendered it down. We do this over a low heat, nice and slowly. Now we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of heat in there. Bring that up. I've got some garlic and onions. Now the onions, nice and thinly sliced, okay, they're going in there, and garlic. Now the garlic, what I've done with the garlic is I've sliced it very thinly too, okay. Give that a little bit of a, bit of a stir. Because I'm using salt pork, I'm not gonna add any salt just now, based on the fact that there's considerable salt already in there, okay. We're gonna let that do its thing for a few minutes. I'm just gonna put a lid on. So the apple we're going to peel and slice. Do the top and the bottom, okay? And then you just run your knife down the outside, one piece at a time. Apples are great for, especially something like this where you've got a, a higher salt content. The sweetness of the apple will really enhance that and balance it out. Now we want our apples to be sliced, okay? So we take the core out, lose the seeds, and then just slice them lengthways. And they can be fairly, fairly thick. You don't want them too thin. Those can go in there for a moment. Cut your potatoes into nice thick wedges. And again, they will retain their shape. Okay, there's our potatoes done. We'll have a little look over here at our onions. So at this point, the onions are nicely, nicely softened, but they're still white. They haven't had a chance to, to brown yet. That's perfect. That can carry on doing that and then we're going to get our cabbage ready. So these are collard greens and collard greens are wonderful. They're, they're quite robust and they'll stand up to the cooking. And we're just going to break them down, not too small. Some Swiss chard and some rainbow chard. Chop it quite coarsely. It will break down. The stalk at the bottom, I'll cut a little bit finer just so we don't have huge pieces. Okay, so what I want to do now is I'm going to take a little bit of apple cider vinegar. So I've brought my heat up quite high in with that little bit of apple cider vinegar. So that's evaporated almost instantly. It does not take very long at all. Then we're going to take all of this wonderful cabbage or collard greens as the case may be. You can see how quickly it starts to shrink down as that vegetables start to cook. Now you'll notice at this point, I've not put the lid back on. Green vegetables have chlorophyll in them and chlorophyll is, has got an enzyme that reacts when it's con constrained. So if you put a lid on this, you'll lose your color. Okay, and you can see how quickly that breaks down and softens up, okay? In with the apples. And that is going to add a touch of sweetness to it. A Little bit of white wine, and I'm using a dry white wine. So again, we wanna balance out the all the flavors here. The wine will start to bring the apple together. They'll start to cook and soften. Then we're gonna take our potatoes. We have to cook the potatoes, of course, because raw potatoes are not terribly palatable. But we're also gonna let those potatoes absorb all the beautiful flavors from the meat. So we're just gonna turn that down a touch now. Put a lid on there to trap that heat while we prepare our meats. Now obviously this fella here is not gonna get cut up because there's a big piece of bone running through the middle there, but we're just gonna drop this fellow in just like so. The salt pork, again, we're just going to cut that into, this is good for four to six people depending how hungry everybody is, okay? And that salt pork is just gonna get scattered around there. And then our garlic coil, nice bit of an angle, just slice them into the number of pieces, five pieces of garlic. And of course this beautiful chorizo. So we're gonna add a couple of good chunks of this into our mix. 
and then that will probably take about 15 to 20 minutes, depending how big your potatoes are, depending how much moisture you've got in there. All the meats are already cooked. We don't have to worry about cooking the meats per se. We need to get them up to a safe temperature, but that'll happen quite quickly with the lid on. To me, choucroute is one of those like wonderful comfort foods, something to have on a cold winter's evening or fall evening. Uh, but the one thing about the choucroute is that it's, it's so heavy. Let's, come on, it's potato, cabbage, and meat. What you really want to look for for a good pairing is something that can cut through that, uh, that heaviness and actually allow you to enjoy as much as you really want. Uh, what, the pairing that I've chosen is the Orofino Risling. Now, Risings are actually pretty traditional when it comes to pairing with this type of dish. Um, it's the, the lemon-lime aspect to it that I think is really going to, to pull out some of those flavors. And I think the apple in the dish will also respond to it. There's a slatiness in the, the Risling that uh, will really play to all the components. Now, maybe my beer bias is showing again, but I think this dish does really uh, go well with beer. Uh, it's the whole like, Alsace German aspect to it. Uh, the beer that I've chosen to pair with it is Spinnaker's Original Pale Ale. Why I chose this beer, one, it's, it's delicate, uh, but it's, it can stand up to heavier dishes. And I think why it can do that so well is it's actually extremely effervescent. People don't often think about how many bubbles in what you're drinking, uh, like how that affects your tongue, but it really, it cleans it, it clears it. And with heavier dishes, you really need that. So enjoy your bubbles. <laughs>